Welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. Well, masks, vaccine hesitance, uh, disparities in health care. But first, let's take a look at about this, an update on Pennsylvania prisons. As they say, let's get to it. Welcome to the fast-paced and unrehearsed weekly discussion featuring the leaders who help shape your world. Join us as we address the issues that impact you each and every day. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Well, I'll tell you, we have a very interesting uh, show this week with a variety of important topics. Sitting across from me is John Wetzel. He's the Pennsylvania Secretary of Corrections. He's been on the program before. Mr. Secretary, welcome. Oh, it's always good to be here. Thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. All right. Well, let's talk about a couple of general topics before we get into uh, some specifics I know that you, you would like to talk about. The size of the prison population in Pennsylvania, up or down? Way down. Way down. As a matter of fact, um, we're at about 37 and a half thousand inmates, um, 14,000 less than when I started wow. uh, over a decade ago. Um, one of the coolest parts about that uh, population reduction is that over 70 percent is in the non-white population. Mm -hmm. So the um, hard work we've been able to do as far as trying to make improvements in the criminal justice system have not only yielded significant savings for taxpayers, mm -hmm. but I think the best news it is that crime is lower today than it was when I started. So we both significantly reduced the population, significantly reduced the spend, and crime is down. So we're heading in a good direction. We yeah. feel pretty good about that. Well, another, another important subject, I think, is the nature of the crimes that the folks have been convicted uh, because, you know, they violated a law, criminal, civil. Has that changed over the last decade or so? It has. I mean, the makeup of the state prison population is, in general, uh, more mentally ill. Uh, it's now a third of our population is suffering mentally from Ill. mental health. Yeah, 36 percent last year of everyone who's in state prison has a mental health issue. Uh, it's, you know, mental health, the, the way we approach mental health in America, all behavioral health, but mental health in particular, you know, it's just uh, an embarrassment for us, frankly. Um, we, we also, Pennsylvania is a state where life means life. So while our population's been reduced by 14,000, the percentage of lifers, we still have over 5,000 people serving life without parole, meaning that they will die in prison. That's what life without parole means. So that number has stayed the same, but now it's a huger part of our um, percentage of the population yeah. overall because they don't yeah. get out. Well, the one, another interesting point that I want to ask you about has, has to do, well, first of all, let me go back to this. Uh, mental health. Should these folks have been getting treatment for mental health before they committed these crimes, or do you think given the, their socioeconomics, uh, that they were probably going to commit crimes anyway? No, I, don't, I mean, I don't think anybody's destined to commit a crime. I think um, addressing behavioral health needs, mental health, uh, addiction, um, which are often the root cause of crimes, keep people out of the system. I mean, yeah. certainly um, when we became an expansion state and focus on um, repairing the, the behavioral health safety net, if you will, that does reduce crime when we keep people healthy in the community. You know, sadly, oftentimes there's not places for people to get help with mental health. Yeah. They ultimately commit a crime and unfortunately, uh, and very disproportionately, by the way, they end up in a jail or prison. Now, the good news is we have some counties doing really good work. York County, for instance, has these wellness courts focusing on, on getting uh, individuals with mental, mental illness back on track. But that's a, that has to be a huge challenge. I mean, prisons weren't set up to do, you know, mental, mental health issues, correct? It's, it's certainly, if you're looking at where to put, give, put someone to get mental health, health treatment, the most expensive and least effective is going to be a state prison. That's why we got to do it in the community, divert people, get them the help they yeah, need so they, yeah. they get back to so living a good So you bring people life. in from, you know, mental health ex, uh, ex, experts, do you bring them into prison to serve the population? Is that in, in, in the regional area in which they live? Is that what you do? Oh, no. We have mental health staff at every prison all the time. I mean, okay. listen, when you have a third of your population being, we're running a mental health system, frankly, when you, a third of the population, let, let me put it in real numbers, over 10,000 individuals individuals are sitting in a state prison today suffering from mental illness. So we have social workers and psychologists and psychiatrists to, to meet those needs because that's our responsibility. All right, we're going to run to a break. When we come back, I want to ask you about COVID in prisons. Uh, obviously, you got a population. It's closely entangled with one another. I think you would agree with Congregate that. Congregate living. Absolutely. Is that what you call that's it? I like call that. It. All right, we'll be back in a moment. 
This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania State Education Association and Partners for Public Education, bringing the power of a great education to our schools, our students, and our communities. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Please visit pahighwayinfo.org. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Welcome back to Pennsylvania Secretary of Corrections. John Wetzel is my guest at the moment. Look, Mr. Secretary, I want to talk a little bit about COVID in prisons. You know, you, you've got this large population in a enclosed area. How's that? And I think you would agree. So what's the situation with uh, COVID in the prisons? Yeah, congregate settings have been one of the more challenging environments for COVID. I'm very proud to say that we're in a great place. We have, we have 25 current um, positive uh, cases among our inmate population. We have about 40 positive cases among our staff. Keep in mind, we have 37 and a half thousand inmates. Mm -hmm. We test over 1% of the population randomly per week. So we have a very good sense that we have very little COVID in our prisons mm -hmm. right now. A lot of it is because our, our inmate um, vaccination rate is very high. 88% of our inmate population is fully vaccinated. Fully vaccinated. Fully vaccinated. Uh, less so with staff. Uh, frankly, we have, we're aware of about 3,500 out of our 15,000 staff that are vaccinated. There's some portion that are vaccinated and we don't know about. Yeah. Um, but our, the objective indications we have, which are the uh, positive tests, again, we test 1% of the population. We also um, test sewage coming out of each prison twice a week, which gives us an objective measure of how much COVID there is in there. And we only have three prisons that even detect any level of COVID whatsoever. Oh, wow. So we're in a great spot and it really 100% of the credit goes to our staff. I mean, keep in mind the early days of COVID when nobody knew what was going on, yeah. when most people were sitting at home working on Zoom, our folks weren't just working in our prisons, but we, we went into several county uh, facilities that had a, bun a large number of staff out and just helping each other out. Yeah. And uh, they did that without uh, vaccines and just putting masks on and just being the brave people they are. And, and they, they get the credit for where we're at. Today. Has that been your most serious challenge? 100%. Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, when if you remember back to the early days of COVID, they basically said we have an invisible disease. We're not really sure how it spreads, but it sits on surfaces for days and all this stuff. And oh, by the way, you have, you know, at that time we had 45,000 people incarcerated and you got to keep everybody six feet away from each mm -hmm. other, which was almost impossible. Yeah, now we were able to reduce expert. the population yeah. by 8,000. Again, yeah. our, our folks on the parole side of the house did a great job of preparing and keeping that parole system going. Mm -hmm. So the population reduction coupled with the great work of our staff have us as, as strong a position as we could be in. Now you have, you have something that you, you refer to as the a dashboard in general, but a dashboard for uh, COVID, is that correct? Yes, yeah, so we have two. Yeah, okay, go ahead. So um, for folks who, who are interested in, in getting regular updates on um, how we're doing with managing COVID, you can go to our COVID dashboard, which you can go look back, go all the way back to the beginning of COVID and look at every day, how many positive, how many negative, oh those kinds of stuff. And you'll see that we're in a great spot. Uh, you know, when you're talking about 37 and a half thousand inmates and less than 30 uh, positive for COVID, you're in a great spot. Um, so you can find any piece of information, vaccination rates, anything by site, by anything you're interested in on the COVID dashboard, which is on our website, mm -hmm. www.cor.pa.gov. But earlier we were talking about our prison population reduction. Right. We also launched the nation's second um, population dashboard. So you can look back in history and look at what the impact of policies in Pennsylvania have had on their prison population and our parole population. Mm -hmm. and, and most importantly, you can look by race. So we can look at racial disparities mm -hmm. and what impact certain right. policies have. It's a really groundbreaking and transparent. Tool. We have about a, min a minute left. Uh, a question about the uh, visitors to see, you know, prisoners uh, up, down, uh, affected by COVID. Yeah, it's affected by COVID. It, since the Delta strain is here, only vaccinated uh, inmates can still receive visits. 
um, because we know, you know, vaxxed and relaxed, right, is, is what we say. So they're, they're safe to get uh, visits. Unvaccinated mates, they're in their own housing unit, and we're, we're keeping them safe from this, mm -hmm. this very uh, dangerous and contagious Delta strain. Well, look, thanks for, uh, uh, for the update. All right, we're going to have an important health care update, and we'll do that after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Cross-State Credit Union Association. Credit unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, go to ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Association of Pennsylvania State College and University Faculties, representing the faculty and coaches who are devoted to providing quality public higher education for Pennsylvania's college students. Well, welcome back. I'm chatting. I'm going to chat with uh, Dr. Michael Delavecchia. He's the president of the of the uh, Pennsylvania Medical Society. I'll tell you, we had a discussion about in the prisons with masks and vaccines. Very interesting. I was listening so to it. So before we get to some uh, other topics, talk in general. There's a lot of confusion about masks, when to wear them, should they be required? And, and similarly with the vaccine, who should get it? Should it be required? Uh, there's a big debate going on about those subjects. R am I right or wrong about that? You're absolutely right, and there should be some debate about it. And the simple reason for that is we are in a point in history that's really never been experienced before. This is unlike the bubonic plague, the smallpox, polio. So what I try to tell other doctors, and our patients especially, this is a learn-as-you-go situation. Mm -hmm. So we may change opinion as you do when you gain more knowledge. But one of the things we want to do as doctors and as patients, of course, is to err on the side of what is best judgment and safety. So if there's any doubt, you know, wear a mask. I think if they feel that it helps or there is some statistics that it helps, wear a mask and get that vaccination. And we know that's the way to best conquer this at the present time. Yeah, and we have the, this Delta variant that's largely responsible for the uptick uh, in the number of people who, who have COVID-19. Exactly. One of the things we know about viruses is they can mutate. And mutations are often run the whole gamut to almost another disease to something very similar. And what we're experiencing now in the Delta variant is a new upsurge in people getting infected. And that's what's accounting for the statistics across the country right now. Yeah, are the, are the people who are getting the Delta variant, it looks like they're, they're in some respects, younger. Uh, you know, younger people are now getting it and getting hospitalized after, you know, during the, the first COVID situation, we didn't have that as much. Am I, right, am I right about that or wrong? To some degrees, you're right. You know, it depends on what segment of the population you're looking at. You know, as a college professor, some of the younger people are more social and more in larger groups, as you'll see when the campuses get back together. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's where the segment of the population is. Yeah. All right, let's turn to another subject. There's also something that you refer to as healthcare disparities. What's a healthcare disparity and why is that important? Healthcare disparities are essentially differences in outcomes or differences in segments of population. Um, so, to give you a case in point, uh, people with more money and living in the city have better access to healthcare mm -hmm. and availability, and they could afford it. Some of the people that are in the rural areas or in the inner city areas do not have that advantage, so they get different outcomes. So that's what is essentially a disparity is. Yeah. And when you look at overall the application of health, public health to people, the doctors in the hospital influence about 20, 30 percent of that segment. The rest of it is basically your living style and your access to health care. Yeah. So if you don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't take drugs, you don't get too stressed, mm -hmm. your health care outcomes will be better than the rest of the population. Now, as, as I understand, the, the booster shot, which is being recommended, uh, is free, is free. Should, should the vaccine be free? 
The vaccine is free. Is free? Yes. Okay. You know, the, the, the U.S. government, you know, really stepped to the plate on this. They developed a scientific protocol within a record amount of time. Okay, and there is no one who wants the vaccine that cannot get it, nor has to pay for it. Some segments of the population have a little bit more availability to mm -hmm. others, in a sense that if you live near a hospital or a pharmacy, you have good access right. to it, right. as opposed to the rural uh, areas of the state. All right, we're gonna run to a break. When we come back, I, wanna, I want you to address addressing the disparities, something that is also important, and we'll do that after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Inspired physicians committed to the good health of Pennsylvanians and the advancement of the practice of medicine. Well, I'm, I'm chatting with Dr. Michael Delavecchia. He is the president of the Pennsylvania Medical Society, and we're talking about a number of important topics dealing with the, can I, can I say the variant? I guess I have to say both, both of them, right? Both. <laughs> All right, let's, let's talk a little bit about how do you address these disparities that you've been talking about? What we try to do with the disparities is actually to find out what are the causes of these disparities. Sometimes it's patient attitude or perception, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's a social issue. Uh, to give you a case in point, if we have somebody who comes in and there are the demographics where you know, that race, that ethnic background has diabetes, we would treat your diabetes. There's only a few ways of treating the diabetes. It's diet, exercise, and medicine. And diet, of course, is probably the primary thing of that. But if a person is poor and they can't get the proper food, they can't afford it, or they don't have access to it, that's affecting the diabetes more than we as physicians giving them medication. Sure. So what we would do is address that social issue to see that that person has access to good, healthy food at a reasonable price in their geography. But that's, that's more than medicine. I mean, that, that takes... Uh how do I put this, a reorganization, if you will, of society when we're talking about what, what people eat? I mean, it's a question of can you afford it? Number two, what is it that you should eat? So it's a combination of what government, and maybe the private sector can, will be involved, and also the, the medical advice. That's absolutely correct, and another important factor is education. Yeah. So children in school, you know, they're used to eating, you know, cakes, soda, and so forth. Uh, that's not a good upbringing, that puts you at risk. Yeah, yeah. So to educate them properly, and hopefully they'll go back to the families and spread that word on what is proper nutrition and healthcare is very important. Yeah. So it's getting to the people, getting the message across. Right. And as we know as grown-ups, it's hard to reverse something you've been doing your whole life. Yeah, and something else, and this is off the, off the topic, but smoking among young people. I mean, if you care about their health, how, how can you not encourage them to give up smoking? And I, I've not seen the statistics on it, but I just noticed a lot more people, uh, you know, it, it's not empirical, but, you know, not scientific, but the fact of the matter is that you think about how, de I don't have to tell you, detrimental that is to health. Well, let's put some of that in the proper perspective. We have teenagers that are, you know, chronic uh, smokers, mm -hmm. you know, a couple packs a day. And if you go back to World War II, every year since then, uh, smoking has killed as many people per year on an average as COVID has. Wow. So we're killing off roughly now close to half a million people a year due to tobacco and tobacco products. And it's not accounting, you know, the people that don't die to get the complications, mm -hmm. the heart disease, the lung disease, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So once again, that is public health, and that is a matter of perception. We grew up with, you know, uh, the sophisticated, virile guy who smoked. You look at some of the older movies in the, in the 40s and 50s. They smoked routinely. Routinely. There was hardly a scene yeah. where a man or a woman, when they were interacting, weren't smoking. Yeah. Okay, and that was not viewed as a public health. But when you're killing off a half million people a year, yeah. and you're yeah. causing in in injury and disease yeah. to another million, that's a serious health problem, a social yeah. health if problem. If you go down and look at the uh, actors and act 
actresses and you, and you look at why they died, I'm shocked at the number of people died from illnesses related to smoking right. because it was so common. Right. And, and as you point out, you watched a movie and there was routinely they smoked. Routinely they smoked. It was a matter of culture. It was a matter of image. There were actually years ago when they allowed tobacco ads on TV, they would say something like, Three out of five doctors prefer this cigarette. Oh, gosh. Uh, uh, I'm sure you remember that, too. Yeah. And that was a disaster. That was, yeah. you know, th that it had some sort of health stamp of it being All okay. Right. All right, let's talk a little bit about vaccine hesitance. There's a, a, a fair amount, a, amount of that. The question of uh, they're hesitant, and they also insist that it's their legal right not to get the vaccine. That's a big problem of, of what freedom is and what freedom mm -hmm. isn't. Uh, we have an obligation in public to be part of society and general health care. The individual, of course, has certain rights. We as physicians know, and it's been proven, as you can see the statistics recently, that the more people we get vaccinated, the more people we get complied to the procedures and the protocols, the better off we're going to be as a, you know, a society. A lot of the newer admissions we're seeing under the Delta virus and other viruses, when you look at the statistics of the admissions to the hospital, there are a very high percentage of those people who have not had the vaccine. Yeah. So that's one of the problems. The hesitancy, as we talked last time, is from a variety of reasons, some of which uh, we would say varies on the ridiculous or obscure, that some people may have a, a valid reason that they think that we could debate yeah. and maybe talk them into you know, a more sensical yeah. approach. Yeah, a number of businesses and certainly uh, many colleges are saying when the students come back, get vaccinated, or every week you have to get tested or show some evidence that you don't, you know, I, I mean, it, and that, seems to be growing as, a, as opposed to not. That's true, and that's some of the tenets of public health that we're learning. So when we're having populations together and interacting, we know that's the point where we have to intervene, such as in a college campus, such as when factories get back to working, such as when restaurants have hundreds of people within a closed environment. You know, what tenets are we going to try to enforce for the good of the public health yeah. with hopefully not interfering with an individual's yeah. right. Well, look, I want to thank you for coming on. This is a, gr a great update, and we'll have you back soon. Terry, it's an honor and always enjoyed it. All right. Thank you. All right. Hey, guess what? We'll see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, stay well.